In this lesson, we are going to talk about domain and range. And the domain of a function are all the x values or all the inputs that you can plug into your function and still get out a value for y. So think of the domain or the set of all x's, if we think of x's as the independent variable. And your range is going to be the set of all the y's. So when I plug in my x's, what are all the y's I can get out? All my outputs. Now there's different ways that you can do this, just like before, because there's different representations of the function. You can find the domain and range from a table. So if I had an xy table, and I asked you to give me the domain and range, you would just list all the x values for domain, and you would list all the range, all the y values for the range. Now, it's a little bit more complicated when you look at a graph or an equation, so we're gonna go through some of those examples in more detail. Um, so let's start looking at finding the domain and range from a graph, and I'm going to um, color coordinate this, so, coordinate this so that it makes it a little bit easier for the visual learners. Now, when you look at the domain, that, remember that's a set of all the x's, and when I look at a graph, I find the values of x's because the graph, when I look at the graph, I scan it from left to right for all my x's, right? Because the x's are the horizontal values. So if I draw a dashed line to see my horizontal values, this graph starts at 2 and stops at 8. So if I look at my horizontal values, now, notice that this has an open circle here. So this is going to be open. I'm not including 2, but everything bigger than 2, all the way up to 8. Those are all my x values. So when I write down my domain in interval notation, it's going to look like this. From 2 to 8, not including 2, but including 8. Now, doing it in blue so we can see the range... The range are all my y values, so now we're going to look at this vertically from top to bottom. I should say bottom to top because you always want to put the smaller value first. So my lowest number goes from 6 on the y-axis to 8 on the y-axis. Because this is open, we're not going to include 8. So all my y values would be from 6, including 6, up to 8, not including 8. Okay, looking at this next example here, let's do domain first. Domain are all the x values. So I want to look at this on the x-axis horizontally. So I'm going to draw my dashed line to kind of visualize this. So my horizontal values go from negative 5 to 3. At 5, it's a closed circle. Sorry, at negative 5, it's a closed circle. And at 3, it's an open circle. So when I write this down, remember you always do it left to right, or you could look at it as low value to high value. So I'm going to write closed negative 5, so bracket with negative 5, all the way up to 3. Open, not including 3. Okay, let's do the blue now, which is the range. My range is on my vertical values, on my y values, so I'm looking at it from bottom to top. Now, it goes all the way down to zero, and there are values there at zero. So I'm going to include zero. And then it goes all the way up to two. Now the question is, because this is open and this is closed, should I include two in my range? 
because two is included here, there is a value of x when y is two, that there is a point there, so I am going to include it. Okay, next example, we'll do this one next. This one's a little bit different because if you notice, I have an arrow here. So when I draw my dashed lines for my domain, if I start here, this arrow tells me I go on forever. There is no stopping point. So when I write down my domain, if I look at this left to right, all my horizontal values, my lowest value is negative four, and that's a closed circle, so I'm including that point at negative four, and it's gonna keep going to the right forever, so that's gonna be positive infinity. Now, when I look at my range, I'm gonna draw my dashed line. This arrow here tells me it goes up forever. Even though it looks like it flattens out here, it doesn't, even though it looks like it does. When you have an arrow, this arrow here means I'm going this way to the right and up forever. Even though it goes up gradually, it does go up. Okay, so when I write this for my range, I start here at negative two, and there's a closed circle there. So I'm including negative two, and it goes up forever, which is um, positive infinity. Okay, this next example here, this last one. Do domain first domain are all my x values. Now, so I have an x value here. I'm going to go left to right. But notice right here it stops. There's no arrow. Okay, it stops here. There's no arrow. There's a point there. And this dashed line here indicates that there's an asymptote. So there's no values there. Um, so when I look at this piece, that is separate. It doesn't continue. There's a point here that it skips over when I have this asymptote. Then it picks up again from here to here. So I have to write this in two intervals because between here and here, there are no x values. Okay? So... When I write down my domain, this interval right here is going to be from negative 6, including negative 6, up to negative, whoops, up to negative 1 sixth. Union, then I have a second interval from here to here, and that's going to go from positive 1 sixth up to 6. And those are all closed circles, so those are going to be brackets because they're all included. Now for the range. Let's erase the pink and do it now in blue. The range are all my Y values. So I'm starting here and I'm stopping here. But then there's a break and then it picks back up here and it goes up to here. So there's nothing in between here. There are no y values in between here. So I start at negative six, and I go up to negative one sixth, union, and then I go from positive one sixth up to positive six for the y. That one was a little tricky because you had to do it in two pieces because there was a break in the graph. So if there's more than one piece, you just do each piece separately and then put them together with the union symbol.
Now, looking at domain and range for an equation. So there are some restrictions that we need to talk about. For example, if I look at this example one, I can't plug in just any x. Remember, domain are all the x values, and I can plug in and get out a value for y. It's all the values of x that I can plug in. I can't plug in, say, negative 5, because then that would give me a negative under square root. And when we're graphing these on the real plane, we can't have negatives under square roots if we're trying to do this with real numbers. So I have to make sure that whatever I plug in for x under here, I get something out that I can take the square root of a positive number. So my first restriction is to consider um, is no negative numbers under an even root. So square root, six root, the eighth root, all those even roots, I can't have a negative under an even root because that would give me an answer that is not real. And we're trying to graph these on the real plane. My second restriction is I can't divide by zero. So here's an example here. I can plug in anything I want there except something that would cause me to have zero in the denominator. So for example, I can't plug in negative three here because if I plug in negative three, that's one over zero, which is undefined. So I wanna make sure in my restrictions, I put no division by zero. So when we look at domain and range in symbolic form of a function, we wanna consider these two restrictions. Now, when we get later on in the class, we're gonna add another restriction to this, but um, that's when we get into logarithms and we're not there yet. So keep in mind that there are going to be other restrictions, we're just not there yet. So for right now, just know these two restrictions. Okay, so when I look at example one, I want whatever is underneath here to be positive. I want x plus one to be greater than or equal to zero. I can take the square root of zero, that's just zero, so I can plug in negative one here and get out something for y, it would be zero. So whatever is underneath there can be equal to zero, but it can't be negative. So when I find my domain, I want whatever is inside my square root to be positive or equal to zero. So I set up this inequality. x plus one has to be greater than or equal to zero, and then I just solve it which means x has to be greater than or equal to negative 1. If I plug in something less than negative 1, that's when I run into a problem, like my example before of negative 5. If I plug in x is negative 5, that won't work. I'll get it, um, a number that's not real. So then, that's my answer. That's my domain in inequality notation. If I want to write it as an interval... Um, in interval notation, then I would write it like this. I want anything bigger than or equal to negative 1. Okay, now in example 2, we already kind of talked about that too when we introduced the restrictions. X cannot be equal to negative 3. I can plug in anything else, but when I plug in negative 3, I'm not going to get out a value for Y. It's going to be undefined. So if I want to write x cannot be equal to negative 3 in interval notation, it would really help if I write it on the number line and visualize this. I can have anything I want except for negative 3. So I would have the whole number line filled out with a circle over negative 3. And what that does is it breaks it up into two intervals. I have this interval here which I can write as minus infinity up to negative 3, not including 3, or negative 3, sorry. And then I would also have, let's use a different, let's use green. I would also have this interval here, which I would write as from negative 3 to infinity. So basically, this is telling me I'm going from minus infinity all the way up to positive infinity, but I'm skipping over negative 3.
This is how I would write it using interval notation. The next example here, example three, I have absolutely no restrictions for this. I don't have any square roots or um, fourth roots, any kind of even roots to worry about. And I don't have any x's in any denominators to worry about getting zero in the denominator. So no matter what I plug in for x, I'm still going to get out an answer for y. I don't have any restrictions on this. I could plug in a million. I could take a million squared plus, whoops, plus two times a million. I'm still going to get out an answer for y. Doesn't matter what I plug in. So I would say for this example, all real numbers. And now there's different ways you can write it down. You can just literally write out all real numbers, or you can write it out if you want an in interval no notation, minus infinity to positive infinity. That means everything. Or another way you can do it is write a fancy bold faced R. That's another way you can write all real numbers. Okay, example four is a little tricky because we have two considerations here. We have to consider square root and an x in a denominator. So if I want everything underneath here, that x minus 3 has to be greater than or equal to 0. So I'm going to set up my inequality. But I also, there's another condition, x also cannot be equal to 5. These are my two conditions, and it has to satisfy both of these, okay? So when I solve for this one, I get x is greater than or equal to 3, but I also cannot have 5. I can't have it because then I'm dividing by 0. So when I draw this on my number line, x is greater than or equal to 3 means I have this everything to the right of 3 with a closing circle on 3, but I can't have 5, so I'm going to erase that one spot right there over 5. This has got to be open. So now I just broke this up into two intervals because I put that open circle there. I have 3, including 3, everything up to 5. Then I have skip over 5, and then from 5 to infinity. This is how it's going to satisfy both conditions. For those of you who are visual learners, I'm telling you it really helps to write the answer on the number line so you can visualize what this answer is, and it helps you put it in interval notation. So for my two intervals, I have from 3 to 5, including 3, but not including 5. So this is where we skip over 5, and then we continue on from 5 to infinity. So this is my answer in interval notation. 3 to 5, including 3, not including 5, and then from 5 to infinity, not including 5. We're skipping over 5. Okay, last example. Again, we have two conditions we have to meet here. We want to make sure that 2x plus 1 is greater than or equal to 0 because x under a square root. But here's the other thing. I also can't have it equal to 0 because it's now in the denominator. So I'm going to fix this and satisfy both conditions by just writing that 2x plus 1 can't be equal to zero, it's just strictly greater than zero. And that's how we're going to meet both conditions when the square root is in the denominator. So now I'm just going to solve this for x. I'm going to subtract one from both sides, and I'm going to divide by two. So I want all the numbers that are greater than negative a half, but not including negative a half. If I plug in negative a half, and I include that in my domain, that's where I'm going to run into a problem because the 2 times the negative 1 half would give me negative 1, and then negative 1 plus 1 would give me a 0. The square root of 0 is 0, and I would have 1 over 0 in the denominator. That's why we're not including 0 in this when I write my inequality. Whoops. 
Okay, so to write this in interval notation, it would be everything greater than negative a half, not including negative a half. So it would look like this. So here's my final answer um, for domain, for finding the domain of one over the square root of two x plus one. So whenever you're approaching um, finding the domain when you're looking at an equation, just keep those two restrictions in mind and ask yourself, what do I have to be careful about plugging in? Do I have square roots? Do I have denominators? And just eliminate those values that you can't plug in and keep the stuff that you can plug in without running into a problem and write that in interval notation.